Welcome to another episode of this reading vlog of The Darkness That Comes Before by R. Scott Baker. Uh, this one is titled Sumna. We are talking about chapter three today, but before I move on, thank you guys so much out there who have been commenting. Uh, the seasoned venture- veterans, as I like to call you, <laughs> it's really helping me keep track or at least get a proper perspective going into this because I, I think that you, you really need to be in the right headspace to get into certain books. This one especially. I don't think you can go into this book thinking you're going to be reading uh, anything like Sanderson, anything like Robert Jordan, anything like Abercrombie even. It's just its own complete thing. And I, I really got a sense of the uniqueness of the culture, or at least the way he describes culture in this chapter. Because fantasy often f- falls into the trap of just kind of creating carbon copies of cultures that have existed more or less on Earth. Whereas Baker seems to be doing something else entirely. I got a very Middle Eastern flair from this chapter from Sumna. Uh, whether or not that was his intention, I do not know, but it doesn't feel entirely Middle Eastern. It feels like inspired by it, but tweaked in such a way that kind of sets it apart. But we have Drusus, a Cayman. He is on this, uh, he's on this boat headed to Sumna. He has some crazy dream. And I note here that there was a, an image of a, of a dragon called Skafra. But anyway, he gets into the city. Uh, one of the sailors kind of confronts him and says something along the lines of, you are not the kind of man who belongs here, something like that. He also gets an image in his head. So an image struck Akamian himself as a boy climbing on the big rocks, uh, the ones his father had used to dry the nets, pausing every few breathless instants simply to look around him. Because we find out a little bit later, um, w- well, maybe we already know this, but um, he, he, he grew up in a, in a fishing village and he was kind of plucked from, from, that, uh, from that existence to serve as a, uh, a sorcerer or learn to be a sorcerer. And there's something else here called the very fabric of existence, or at least that's what he refers to it as, the onta. He had, and he could still never adequately express this, experienced it. Unlike most others he'd known immediately, he was one of the few, capital few, well, capital F, known with a child's stubborn certainty. So those times when the mandate had passed through his fishing village right here, this is when we learn about it, had profoundly marked him as a boy. I guess the one thing I love about Akamian's character is that he's constantly thinking about the past. When we last him, le- when we left, when we when we left him last chapter, he was thinking about Inrau. He was thinking about Esmenet, I think her name is. Uh, how he could have had a life, like a real life. He almost viewed uh, Inrau as a son, and so he's kind of picturing this familial life with, with these two people. Even though we do learn. <laughs> Esmenet is a harlot, as she describes herself in this. So that's one thing we did not know, or I did not know, when we got into this chapter. But we find out here uh, from this guy, he says, Methanet has called the faithful to Sumna. He said, suspicious of Akamian's ignorance. He's to reveal the object of the holy war. So this is the, the big deal that everybody is, is completely worried about. And then he goes and meets Esmenet, the harlot. <laughs> uh, the interesting thing that I found with this chapter is, Time has passed, and he's looking upon her with, with, with different eyes, so to speak. Uh, he, he remembers how beautiful she, she used to be, and, and he's starting to see the, the lines of age or, or, or the, the signs of age on her, and he's, I don't know, he's just feeling a little bit different. Time is passing him by, and it's really cool to have a character like this because usually in fantasy novels, you don't have a character like this as the protagonist, and I, I'm not sure if... Uh, Baker is really into having protagonists or not. But anyway, this is the character he's focusing on so far. I'm not sure it's going to switch up in, in part two or anything. You know, normally it's not the <laughs> normally it's not these older guys, these sorcerers who are, who are having, you know, regrets in life, right? They're at the, they're toward the end of their life and they're just thinking back and reminiscing about what, what could have been. Usually it's, you know, a young pup, you know, out out to save the world or, or, or talk to gods or something like that. So it's a, it's a really nice change of pace. We also learned, too, that uh, she says, you've suffered the fevers before, capital fevers. Uh, she said, her voice apprehensive. The fevers were not contagious. Everyone knew this. Don't really know what that is. Um, but again, I don't think I need to know all the details quite yet. And I love this line right here. Esmenet, a strange old-fashioned name for a woman of her character, but at the same time oddly appropriate for a prostitute. Esmenet, how could a name affect him so? She had dwindled in the four years since he had last come to Sumna. So that's when he's, he's thinking about what she used to be, even though it's been a short four years. And I really love this exchange too. We make a sad couple, she said, as though making a casual observation. Why would you say that? A sorcerer and a harlot. There's something sad about that. 
He grasped her hand and kissed the tips of her fingers. There's something sad about all couples, he said. Something to mull over. Um, I'm not quite, quite sure what that means either, but needless to say, it's something to ponder. Uh, this is when he goes to a tavern and then uh, he finds in Rao. And in, in Rao, he calls him boy. He, he's happy to see him and he's kind of still referring to him as, as his, um, his son in a, in a way. And he calls him uh, you know, a boy and he says, don't call me boy. So in Rao, is, he's different. He's, he's kind of buying into the, the, the Mathanet kind of thing, the, the holy war ideal. One thing I noted here too is that Ackerman, he's always questioning himself. There's these italics that are, you know, direct thoughts of his. And he's always saying, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? What am I doing here? That's, that's definitely um, something that, that Baker is, is, is repeating quite often to just illuminate just, um, again, it, it's, it's, it's the reminiscing, right? It's looking back and, and like, what the hell am I doing here? I could have a better life. I could have had a better life, but I'm stuck doing this. But these knights spot him. Actually, one does. His name is Lord Sar Sar Sarcellus, Sarcellus, a knight commander. And uh, he poses as, I think, the guy's uncle, as in Rao's uncle. But then Sarkalis's backhand snapped his head sideways. So he gets backhanded here. I, I didn't quite get it. I know that I know that uh, Akamian was being kind of crude. He, he was kind of joking with him. He was kind of being vulgar. But I don't know. It just kind of came out of nowhere to me. M maybe just the scene didn't telegraph, right? But let me know if I'm missing something or if I did miss something. And this next scene is really when I got a sense of just, again, more scale. Uh, the cultural influences and stuff like that is when he's going to go um, in this massive crowd to uh, see Mathanet or Mathanet, Mathanet, something like that. But I, this really stood out to me. So he's he's kind of just pushing his way through these insane crowds. And it says, at some point, he cursed everything, the punishing sun, the thousand temples, the forearm between his shoulder and, and, and Mathanet. So what I loved about that is it was kind of thinking about bigger ideas, right? The, the beating sun, a thousand temples, but then something as simple and annoying as a form in his back because he's he's kind of in a mosh pit right now. And the funny thing about that is he he gets lifted up, kind of he's crowd surfing at one point. And this is when uh, Mythanet himself shows up. So the new Shriya was a powerful figure, as tall as any Norciare, wearing a crisp white gown and sporting a thick black beard. He made the priests who flanked him seem womanish. So he goes and gives a spiel about um, Shime. So we know Shime, the city. Mathanet cried as though this name lay at the root of all sorrow. The city of the latter prophet lies cupped in the heathen's palm, on, in, in unclean, blasphemous hands. The hallowed ground of Shime has become the very hearth of abominable evil. And he ends with, We shall war and we shall war until Shime is free. So that city is clearly important for some reason. We know that um, Kellis was looking for it in the very beginning, but they want Shime, Shime. The schools were never threatened. So this is finally when um, uh, Kamian realizes that uh, the desire of this man is not what he assumed. And this is when they, they kind of pick him up and he's crowd surfing. But who does he see? He sees Proyas. And I think I forgot to mention that in the last chapter. He was another student. So it was Prince Nerse Proas of Conria, another student he had loved, loved. It's interesting that he um, uses that word often. At first I thought it meant something else, but clearly it's more of a fatherly love. But then the Shriya himself speaks to Akamian. Your kind are not welcome here, friend. Flee. Which is strange to Akamian because as he notes, he can see the few with a capital F. And then Proyas heads off. He gets taken to this place where he sees this massive tusk, this horn-like thing. But Akamian, insolent wretch, how could you commit such an outrage? So this is... um. Proyas thinking that. And this is when he sees the tusk, a great winding horn of ivory, half in sunlight and half in shadow, suspended by chains that soared upward and were lost in the contrast of bright sky and pillared gloom. That's a really cool uh, description. The tusk, holiest of holies. And he meets up with Mathanet, and this is what he says. This is, these are the last words he leaves him with. Who was that man, that sorcerer, who dared pollute my presence? Which brings us to the end of chapter three. So, I don't know. I liked it, but it wasn't my favorite chapter. I feel like some of the earlier ones were. I think it's just I'm not it's hard for me to get in, invested in political machinations and stuff like that unless I'm invested in characters. And usually that takes some time. But here we are only in chapter three, already getting kind of deep into it. And I understand Baker is trying to thrust us into this world. He's trying to have it envelop us. 
uh, not really explain anything, not really build up into anything. And that's okay, that's okay. I think that is definitely one way to do it. And I can definitely see someone who is really interested in terminology and factions and, and, and political machinations, designs, etc., being very, very into this chapter. But for me, it was okay. I'm really glad though that there were some quiet moments again. We had a came in on the boat in the beginning. We had him at the tavern with, with Enrao. And I did like the scene though. I did like the, the mosh pit scene. Uh, one other thing to note too is that the paragraphs were extremely long in that section, but I think that was definitely purposeful because there was such vivid description of what was going on with Akamian, how he was lifted up into the crowd and he was crowd surfing like he was at a rock concert. But I thought um, it was definitely a, a good way to to set the stage, right? I definitely felt the the immensity, the grandeur grandeur of, of everything. And I'm excited to see what happens next now that um, this guy, this this crazy guy knows that he is a sorcerer because that is one thing that uh, the spy Akamian did not want anybody to know, as we found out earlier in the book. I think it was like uh, chapter one. But I guess I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, still enjoying it. Uh, this one was a little bit more dense, I think, uh, than I'm used to. Uh, well, the terminology, like I said, but I'm excited to see where the end of part one goes because I'm hoping for an arc. I love little arcs. Maybe it's a cliffhanger. Maybe we're going to meet a new character, a new protagonist, quote unquote protagonist in part two. I have no idea, but let me know. Did I miss anything? Did I get anything wrong? Is there any information that will help me grasp what is going on here? Or, you know, like I said, may maybe not. Maybe I should just let this novel wash over me, like I keep saying, and just slowly take it in. And hopefully the repetition will make things make sense. So again, Thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for watching. And I will see you in the next one with chapter four.